Welcome to Time in the Word with Pastor David. I'm your host, Dr. J. That's the letter J, David Chrisman. And I'm so thankful we can share this moment of devotional together. Our study today is based upon a devotional in chapter one of my book, Flourish in Faith, a study for personal Christian growth in the Epistle of James. To find out more, visit my website at chrismanpublishing.com. This is episode four, and today we're looking into the topic, Blessed are the Tempted. So take your copy of God's Word and turn to James chapter one, or if you're multitasking, listen along as I read the passages to you. Today we'll start with James chapter one and verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. This beatitude is a great encouragement because it promises a crown to those who patiently endure trials. The believer is rewarded by enduring trials. Satan wants to use trials to tear us down, but God uses them to build us up. The motivation he has then, of course, is love. James uses love as the spiritual motivation behind the imperative that we're given in the section we're about to read. We have a joyful attitude as we face trials because we love God. He loves us and we know he will not harm us. This statement is in complete agreement with the recurring words of Jesus who said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. He said that in Matthew 10, 22, Matthew 24, 13, and Mark 13, 13. So the trials and tribulations of life in this world are not to be endured out of a dull indifference to pleasure or to pain, but rather they're to be endured in a helpful and loving faith in God through Jesus Christ, knowing that he will see his people through safely. Now let's look at James 1, uh, verses 13 through 18. We'll start with verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. See, that's the deception of sin. I'm going to interject this real quickly. The deception of sin is that it looks good. It seems good. It seems right. If it's not hurting anybody else, what difference does it make? That's the prevailing idea. But it's not a good and perfect gift. It is a deception. Because every good and perfect gift, as we're told here in verse 17, is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God's not going to change his mind that what was sinful yesterday is not sinful today. He's not going to change his mind. He never changes. If it was sinful yesterday, if it was sinful a thousand years ago, if it was sinful... 5,000 years ago, it's still sinful today and it will still be sinful tomorrow. But in verse 18, he says, he choose, he chose here in verse 18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. We must then distinguish carefully between testing times and tempting times. God permits tests. God permits tests here. We need to understand that. God permits tests so that believers might show the genuineness and durability of their faith. But temptation, on the other hand, does not come from God. Sometimes the trials that we receive are times of testing on the outside, and sometimes the temptations that we face are on the inside. Trials may be tests sent by God, or they may be temptations sent by Satan and encouraged by our fallen nature. 
If we're not careful, though, the testing on the outside may become temptation on the inside. Because when our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, questioning His love, resisting His will, and looking for the shortcuts that so often result in sin. At this point, Satan provides us with an opportunity to to escape the difficulty and to escape it easily. Just think about when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Turn these stones to bread. Cast yourself off this uh, precipice here and the angels will catch you. Bow down and worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms. Shortcuts. That's essentially where temptation breaks down is shortcuts. James 1, 13 through 15 gives us an anatomy of temptation here. In verse 13, the Bible tells us that after using the word temptation, that is in the sense of trial, James now uses it in the sense of a solicitation to sin. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone with evil. Evil temptations come from evil, not from God, whether they be from Satan or whether they be from our own sinful nature. They come from evil not from God. James quotes someone as saying, I am tempted by God. But James responds by saying, God is not even the remotest source of your temptation. In other words, don't blame God for temptation. He's too holy to be tempted and he's too loving to tempt others because there's always consequences to temptation when we give into it. There's always consequences of sin. God can forgive us of our sin, and He will forgive us of our sin if we confess and repent and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's still consequences. God does test us as He did Abraham. Uh, where we remember the great test of faith that He had with His son Isaac upon the altar. But God does not, cannot, and will not tempt us. A temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. That is, out of the will of God. It doesn't matter how good the thing is that you're doing. If you're doing it out of God's will and out of God's way, it is a sin. It's a bad thing. In in verse 14, James states very pointedly here where the responsibility lies. Ultimately, each person is responsible for, for their own temptation. The culprit here is lust. Lust is a strong desire. It's the idea, the word gives this is the idea of being beguiled or being allured. This refers to any strong desire outside of God's will. It might be a desire for fame, position, power, wealth, illicit sexual relations, and many more. God has given us urges that are natural. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, anger, be fruitful and multiply. The desire for procreation. And there's nothing wrong with these desires. But it is when we want to satisfy them in ways outside of God's will that we get into trouble and it turns into sin. The secret is being in constant control. These desires must be our servants and not our masters. And this we can only do through the power of Jesus Christ. James used the word here enticed, which refers to deception or being drawn away. The idea that's used here is the idea of baiting a trap. In fact, the Greek word used here means to bait. It carries with it the image of baiting a hook. James is using fisherman terms here. The fisherman has to use bait in order to attract and catch their prey. The idea is to hide the hook inside the bait. And so temptation always carries with it some bait that appeals to our natural desires. See, the bait not only attracts us, but also hides the fact that yielding to the desire will bring the hook, which is sorrow and judgment. The bait, the temptation, keeps us from seeing the hook, the consequences 
of sin. James pictured a believer at rest in the settled restraint here of disciplined living under the faith. And then suddenly the bait was presented and the the believer was lured out of their sense of rest. That is, they weren't alert. The Bible tells us, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, he He's, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour as he roams about. Be alert. When that believer at rest took the bait, he was surprised that he had been caught and could not escape. Oh, how often a life and a witness has been destroyed simply by yielding to a temptation. It's happened so many times with so many people in this life. It's it's important for us to stay alert and watch out for those hooks and those baits of temptation. In verse 15, James changed the figure of speech from fishing to childbirth. Lust here is personified as an evil seductress who entices a person and then conceives and gives birth to a terrible offspring. When lust gives birth, the birth certificate reads the name sin. And when sin reaches maturity, it too takes part in a terrible conception because sin produces the monstrous and terrible offspring of death. Sin causes death, spiritual death, physical death, death of a reputation, death of a ministry, death of a marriage death of a conscience. The list goes on and on and on. There is a payday someday when it comes to sin, and sin always results in death. In disobedience, we've moved from the emotions, that's a desire, and the intellect, that's the deception, to the very will itself. Desire conceives a method for taking the bait. The will then approves and acts and the result is sin, we're hooked. The baby's born and just wait until it matures. That's the important thing to realize about this. Christian living is a matter of the will, not the feelings. The the world likes to say today, well, just follow your heart. You can't follow your heart. Jeremiah tells us the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? You can't trust it. Christian living is a matter of the will not the feelings. Immature Christians easily fall into temptation. They let their feelings make their decisions. Disobedience gives birth to death, not life. In verse 16, James instructs us not to be deceived. Do not suppose that God is the author of sin or that he compels anyone to commit it. God is never the father in this terrible family of darkness. He is rather, as James describes him, the father of lights. This verse may be taken as referring to those just mentioned who deceive themselves with the notion that God is the one that's tempted them with evil desire. It can also relate to the point that follows concerning God as the very source of every good and every perfect gift. Christians are to maintain spiritual perspective and not to make the error here in recognizing that all temptation may come from God. It doesn't. We need instead to recognize that all good gifts come from God. So in verse 17, James point out that whatever is good You see, it's another reminder to us, whatever's good comes from God, and he never changes. So whatever is evil, then, comes from Satan and from our own fallen nature, both of whom are bent on doing whatever gains a selfish and sinful end. Left to ourselves, we will destroy ourselves, not make ourselves better. One of the enemy's tricks is to convince us that our Heavenly Father is holding out on us and that he does not really love and care for us. 
That's the temptation. Well, if you become a Christian, if you follow Christ, you're going to miss out on this, that, and the other. Let me tell you something. If you follow Christ, you're not going to miss out on anything this world has to offer because everything it has to offer ends in destruction, ends in regret, ends in emptiness. Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness by alluding to this question. He said, if your father loves you, why are you so hungry? That's, that was the illusion he gave. The goodness of God should be a great barrier against yielding to temptation. And Jesus presented four facts about the goodness of God. One, God gives only good gifts. Two, the way God gives it is in a loving and gracious manner. That in itself is good. Number three, God gives constantly. That phrase coming down means to keep coming down. This is what uh, James is presenting here as James presents these four facts about the goodness of God. And number four, God does not change. It is impossible for him to change. He was good yesterday. He's going to be good today. He's going to be good tomorrow. He gives only good gifts. He gives them in a loving and gracious manner. He constantly gives them and he will never change in that fashion toward his children. Aren't you glad of that today? It's important to know that in this attribute of unchangeableness, God cannot change for the worst because he's holy and he cannot change for the better because he's already perfect. The phrase no variation or shadow of turning that he uses here, it's an astronomical term. It's descriptive of the varying positions of the heavenly bodies that cause changes in the seasons of the year and in the light and darkness we experience here on the earth. God is not changeable like this. In every season, he is the same. In other words, he does not change like the shadow on a sundial. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as Hebrews 13, 8 reminds us. He is such a great light that not even a shadow can be cast on him. In verse 18, James notes that God does not give birth to temptation but to regeneration. Lust gives birth to sin and death, but God's word gives the new birth and eternal life. And using the phrase of his own will, James references that it's God's will that everyone would be saved, begotten by the word. John 3, 16, 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2 Peter 3, 9, Revelation 22, 17. All of these reference the fact that it's not God's desire that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's gifts are always better than Satan's bargains. Satan never gives any gifts because you end up paying for them dearly. It's like the store that promises you a discount when you come in and you go in and spend a bunch of money that you didn't intend to spend, and then you come out saying, oh, I saved so much money. <laughs> we joke about that a lot, but it's true. Satan never gives any gifts because you always wind up paying for everything that you get from him. Verse 15 tells us to look ahead and beware of judgment. And verse 17 in James 1 tells us to look around and see how good God's been to us. And in James 1 verse 18, the Bible says, look within and realize you've been born from above and you possess the divine nature. But you often hear someone say, this was even more popular years ago, the devil made me do it. This was a famous saying by the comedian Flip Wilson. I know some of you who may be watching today may, may remember Flip Wilson from back in the day. His comic cop-out is today's tragedy. The temptation to place blame is alluring. In no area of life is this more evident than the human drift toward irresponsibility for sin. Society left unchecked can continually drift toward an apathetic attitude, toward error, and toward iniquity. This is true of our society today. We are fast becoming what is being called a post-Christian society, a society that no longer recognizes sin, 
a society with no shame, a society driven by secular humanism that says, if it feels good to you, it's not hurting anybody else. Go ahead and do it. It leaves God. It leaves Jesus. It leaves God's word. It leaves sin out of the picture in all walks of life today. And this is sad to say, even in our churches, sin is not simply outward disobedience. Sin is also an inner rebellion or desire. In 1 John 2, 16, we are warned about the desires of the flesh and of the eyes and about the pride of life, all of which are sinful. There's sin in a transgression of the law or literally lawlessness. Sin is a refusal to submit to the law of God. It's a refusal to do so. Sin is basically selfishness. It is what I want to do over and against what God would have me do. You and I must give priority consideration to our natural bent toward escaping the blame for our sins. When I refuse to take the blame for my sin, I resign myself to the status of a victim and I cry out, I've been exploited. I've been used. I've been framed. When I deny blame for my sin, I substitute excuse for the sin to ease my conscience, which in turn deadens my conscience. When I reject blame for my sin, I lie to myself and I aim to another shattering blow here at my personal integrity. When I decline blame for my sin, I attempt to exclude myself from accountability for the consequences of my sin. When I refuse to accept blame for my sin, I endeavor in fantasy to absolve myself of my own guilt. The irresponsible tendency then is to say, who's to blame? Anyone else, anything else but me. Only as you are ready to accept the earthly personal tension of good and evil are you prepared to consider a hard and realistic look at your own bent toward blaming your sin on someone or something else. Biblical teaching concerning sin, private experiences of temptation to do wrong, personal consequences of your own sin, and knowledge of the atrocities caused by sin, all of these lead us to readily conclude that something other than good exists. Even so, the undeniable tendency to waive responsibility, relinquish liability, and disclaim accountability for sin attest to being ruled by forces or influences beyond our personal control is what prevails in our hearts and minds. This was true in the story of the serpent of Adam and Eve. You can see that all the way back in early in Genesis, Genesis chapter three. Whenever God confronted Adam and Eve concerning what had happened, what was the first thing they did? They went on a snake hunt. <laughs> They went on a snake hunt. This is our response to God's inquiry today. We must see God's displeasure and God's intolerance of our tendency to place the blame somewhere else. Today, we still snake hunt. Consider some of the snakes we blame. Environment. Even though Lot's wife never cut ties with the culture of Sodom, her act of turning back, her act of longing to go back was her own choice, and she paid the consequences. Paul grieved over one of the, uh, one of the people that he named Demas to follow the call of missions, but in his letter to Timothy, he emphatically labeled Demas' desertion as a chosen action. He deserted what God called him to do. We can blame our environment all we want to, but our environment is not to blame for our sin. We might, in, we might also blame bad blood. That is our family or our inheritance. Listen to what 1 Kings twenty-two fifty-one 51 through 53 tells us of Ahaziah. Ahaziah, 
the son of Ahab, became king of Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he followed in the ways of his father and mother and of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He served and worshiped Baal and aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, just as his father had done. Who could present a better case for an inherited or a familial evil? But the scriptures never dismiss his accountability. You can't blame your genetics. You can't blame your family for your own sin. Well, here's another snake hunt we go on. That's rationalism. Jonah resorted to logic in his prayer to vindicate himself and express his displeasure over Nineveh's repentance. He tried to rationalize his sin away, but God challenged the validity of his reasoning. We can't rationalize our sin. Well, here's another one, circumstances. The prodigal son's elder brother attempted to convince his father and himself that his need to stay home, serve the family, and keep the father's commands gave him the right not to accept his brother. That's reflected in Luke 15, 29. But Luke does not record any account of the resolution of this sin. It's a sin to blame our circumstances and to use our circumstances to rationalize our sin. Maybe we might also blame fate. The man with the single talent that had been given in the parable of the talents attempted to assign himself the title shortchanged. In Matthew 25, 24, the Bible tells us, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. He tried to assign himself the title shortchanged. It was his fate that he served a master like that and he lost all. Sometimes we might try to rationalize the being a poor worker. Well, I've, I've got poor work conditions or I've got a poor work boss. It's just my fate. This is my fate. I have to resign myself to it. That's no excuse for sin. The snake hunt goes on and on for more and more. But no matter how sin is committed, it will be exposed. Our responsible option, the only true and responsible option is this. Confess, I have sinned and repent of that sin that God might cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession of sin is not words alone. Sin is an act of the total person. Responsible admission of guilt involves more than just rote words and must reach to the very marrow of our soul. Sin destroys health because the accompanying guilt visits life with a unique kind of stress that eats away at the moral, emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual parts of our life. When I blame my sin on someone else or any event or circumstance, I attempt to deny the disease itself that will kill me. For Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And we're ultimately faced with the only alternative. Luke 5.21 tells us, who can forgive sins but God alone? Turn your temptation into a test that you will pass with flying colors. Stand firm on your foundation of faith and build your house upon the word of God. Confess your sin and repent of it. Then when the winds of temptation blow against you, your house will stand you will stand firm through the confession you've made, through the repentance of your sin, and through following God's word in your life. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7 reminds us of this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. 
Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. Hallelujah. And to our God, for he will pre freely pardon. Praise the Lord. Did you catch that? Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. You can do that today. Confess, repent, follow Jesus Christ. If he's not your savior, you can settle that today. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible study. I pray the Lord will bless this devotional to your heart as he has to mine. Please like and comment on the video. I love to know you're watching. I love to hear your insights. If you're watching on YouTube, click that subscribe button and the little bell icon there to be notified when new Bible study videos are posted. If you're listening on the podcast, please leave a rating and review so other listeners can find our Bible studies. And visit chrismanpublishing.com for blogs, books, and additional resources to help strengthen your daily walk with Christ. Thanks again for joining me for today's time in the Word with Pastor David. And until next time, be sure to have your own time in the Word each and every day.